Thank you once again for joining us, John. Well, thank you very much. And uh, and uh, I, I always have to look because you never know with Zoom things where exactly I am. So I have to I have to look and, and I'm and I'm glad you reminded me where I am tonight because I think tomorrow night I'm in East Providence, Rhode Island. And I think tomorrow morning I'm in um, someplace south of Boston. And I think on Monday I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. So it's always, it's a, you kind of lose track of where, where you are virtually these days. So um, just a little, a um, little bit about me. I've been with AAA now for 36 years. Uh, before I came to work at AAA, I worked as an automobile mechanic, service manager, and then came to AAA, ran something called our auto diagnostic center, which was a a uh, place where people could bring their cars. We would tell them what was wrong with them. We didn't do any repairs. We just let them know what kind of condition their car was in. Then at some point, I ended up in a different department called approved auto repair. And then eventually in the public affairs department where my background in automotive repair kind of merged nicely with traffic safety issues. Um, as we started to see more and more traffic safety technology come into cars. Um, I also write a column for the Boston Globe, the Providence Journal, and uh, Newsday in New York, and do a little radio show on Saturdays. And uh, it's all about cars for that matter. So those are some of the things that I do. And the presentation that I have today is um, sort of some of the general questions that I get. Uh, if people do have questions, I put it in the chat, but my email is in the chat, uh, jpaul at aaanortheast.com, or you can go to aaa.com slash car doctor, and you'll find a place to ask me a question. I'll answer questions about just about anything related to AAA. Uh, if it is not something I'm familiar with, I'll try to find an answer for it, but uh, if it is something, if it is something you need to see or want, um, easy enough to find. So my email is should be at the top of the chat, uh, jpaul at aaanortheast.com or aaa.com slash car doctor. And that's also in the PowerPoint presentation too. So um, if people do have questions, if you just want to, um, Kind of unmute yourself and ask. I will be happy to do it that way. We don't have a big crowd, so I think we can all be able to work that out pretty easily. Um, so without going anymore, let's see if we can figure out how to share here so we can do that and um, get going here. So the power, so the presentation again. I, I'm just calling it uh, car uh, car care. Ask the car doctor, and again, that's sort of what I go for for this uh, for this presentation. That's uh, again, my title sort of varies like a lot of people these days. So, um, and I'll I'll try to uh, answer whatever questions I can. Um, so, one of the questions I get all the time is. How often do I need to change the oil in my car? And especially with COVID and the pandemic, how important is it to get my car serviced on a regular basis? Well, the old days of do I need to change my car's oil every 3,000 miles, true or false, really is false these days. Oil has gotten so much better. Oil filters have gotten so much better. And cars have gotten so much better that the old days of changing car oil that frequently really isn't necessary at all. Um, when I first started in the repair business, um, it was not unusual for people to come in every 3,000 miles and have their car's oil changed. Uh, today, again, it's not really necessary. Um, we have one car in our family that really hasn't, I don't think it's gone more than 4,000 miles in the past year. According to the owner's manual, the oil needs to be changed once a year or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes first. Uh, I'm a big believer in, even if your car doesn't go very, very, very many miles, first off, 
whatever it says in the owner's manual, that's what you need to go by. Secondly, if there is no mention of time, uh, and I was looking at a Lexus for someone the other day, and oh, I'm sorry, it was a Genesis, and they have no mention of time as far as oil changes. And they said, well, it says I should do it every 7,000 miles. It's only been 2,000 miles and it's been 13 months. I'm like, get an oil change. Get an oil change at least once a year. That's the best thing you can do for your car as far as that goes. It's you know going any longer than that, I don't think is, is very good. My own personal car uh, that gets driven a lot more, although short trips in the last year, um, it had been just about nine months or so. Uh, whatever day, it was kind of a nice day. I actually changed the oil in the car. The oil looked pretty good, but still um, it was due and uh, well under the 7,500 miles. But time-wise, it was time to do it. So do you need to change your car's oil every 3,000 miles? False. Uh, follow the instruction in the owner's manual. Is synthetic oil worth the extra money? I hear this from people a lot. Should I spend the extra money for synthetic oil over conventional oil when I go to get my oil changed? And here's a couple uh, coupons. Um, home of the $39.99 oil change, conventional oil. The other one was a Kia dealership that had an ad. Synthetic oil, $89.95. I will let you know that I am pretty frugal. I don't like to waste my money, but I will spend extra money on synthetic oil. In fact, my personal car, doesn't require synthetic oil, but I spent the money to put synthetic oil in because I think it has some benefits of allowing the car to run cleaner, it runs cooler, and it synthetic oil protects better against cold weather startup and engine wear and tear. So even if your car doesn't need synthetic oil, it's not a bad idea to use it. Um, the other car in our family is a Volkswagen. That's the one you can go a really long time between oil changes. It's required to use synthetic oil in that car. And that's what we use. And uh, we use it because it's required. Um, is all gasoline created equal? True or false? Uh, I always used to think it was true. I thought if you bought gasoline at the raceway station or the Murphy station or the, or, you know, the, the, uh, BJ's, it's the same gasoline that you get at Shell or Mobile. Well, come to find out it isn't. There are different additives and different gasoline that can affect the way your car runs. And there is something called top tier gasoline. Top tier gasoline um, keeps your engine cleaner and it protects the engine against some of the carbon that builds up in the engine in the combustion chamber. Um, top tier gasoline. Um, this is a picture of, and if you want to find out more information about it, go to toptiergas.com. But this is a picture of two valves inside an engine. And inside your engine, there's pistons and valves, and the valves open and close and let air and fuel in. And uh, when they open, they let exhaust gas out. The valve on the right is an engine that was run for a long period of time with regular gasoline. The one on the left was top tier gasoline, same octane, same 87 octane, regular gas. But you can see that one valve is really clean and one valve is really dirty. Um, that carbon, that gunk that builds up on the valves absorbs gasoline. It, caused the engine, it can cause the engine to run rough. And when allowed to build up more and more and more, um, can actually cause the engine to run rough enough where it will actually set a check engine light. So top tier gasoline cleans, cleans the engine better. It also has a, an overall cleaning ability. So if you don't use it all the time, near my house is a stop and shop gas station. Um, we get points or save money to get gas there. It's not top tier gas. So maybe every you know, couple of weeks we get gas there. Every couple of weeks we get gas at a, a BP or a Sitco station kind of on the other side of where I live. And those are both top tier gasoline. So if you want to find brands and what it is, go to toptiergas.com. And again, it's just gasoline with more additives in it 
that helps keep your car clean. And unlike some of the other commercials you say about using premium to get this cleaner in it, that's not necessary in top tier gas. It's, it's in all octane. How often should my car's tires be rotated? Um, 5,000, 7,500, 10,000 miles. People have different opinions on that. Um, follow the owner's manual is one thing to do, but also generally one, once or twice a year is a good idea because as you rotate the tires, and I don't, and I'll be honest, I don't rotate the tires on my car hardly at all, but I do check them periodically to make sure that they're wearing evenly. If they're wearing evenly, I just leave them alone. But if I start to notice a little bit of uneven wear, then I will rotate the tires. Um, so the other, the other good thing is, and we're offering this right now, if you go to AAA.com slash repair, uh, you'll find a listing of all of our approved auto repair garages. These are garages that had to go through a lot of scrutiny to get on the list, and then they get inspected on a regular basis. But through the month of April, these garages are offering a free wheels off. So take, your, take the wheels off, look at the brakes on your car, and they'll also rotate your tires at the same time. So they'll do that for free. So it's Somewhere there's a value of $100 to $135 to have that done. So you go to AAA.com slash repair, um, find a, they, and they do it by appointment only, um, but it is free and take a look. But uh, rotating your tires every six months or a year is also a great excuse to look at the brakes in your car and see how they're doing. It's always cheaper to replace brakes before they need to be done than when they're scraping and worn out. Um, Engine coolant or engine antifreeze. Um, it's sometimes called permanent antifreeze. And the question is, does it last the life of the car? It doesn't. It needs to be changed periodically. And the picture on the far left that says American alcohol is what antifreeze used to be. Back in the old days, antifreeze was alcohol. You pour alcohol into your car's radiator and it would prevent the engine from freezing in the winter time the bad thing about alcohol was it evaporated and you would need to replace it periodically even over the course of the winter then they came out with the kind of picture in the middle that says permanent ethylene glycol based antifreeze well um, ethylene glycol is a chemical that that doesn't freeze it mixes with the water and but it doesn't last forever Advancements have been made in antifreeze engine coolant, and it does last a lot longer. Uh, the one on the far right says five years. We see engine coolant today lasting five, six, or seven years, but it can get contaminated and it can cause some engine wear and tear. So this is where it's important to go into a good garage that you trust and have them check out the um, antifreeze in the car they'll make sure it's protected to um, a 50-50 mix of antifreeze is protected to minus 34 degrees, which is, unless you live up in way up in the Northern part of New York, you're not gonna see temperatures um, colder than that. And if you do, you add more antifreeze. You add 75% antifreeze and 25% water, and it'll protect it to about 60 below zero. But um, it doesn't last forever. So three, four, five years, you never really know, but it doesn't last forever and it is important to change it. Um, the antifreeze can get acidy and the acid can actually eat away the inside of the engine and especially a part called a cylinder head gasket, um, which can get to be an expensive repair and it can happen from not doing maintenance. Um, true or false, will an aftermarket remote car starter or any accessory void my car's warranty? Well, years ago, well, let me back up. If it's a part that doesn't alter the performance of the car. So in other words, if you had a performance car like a Subaru WRX STI or a Ford Mustang or Chevrolet Camaro, and you got some sort of tuning chip that made the car make more horsepower, that could void the warranty. But if you added something like an aftermarket car stereo, 
an alarm system or a remote car starter, it will not void the warranty. You are protected by something called the Magnuson Moss Law, which basically says any part that, um, that is said to void the warranty of a car that you want to have installed. And if they say you can't do it because it'll void the warranty, the manufacturer has to provide that part for free. So they're not going to do that, obviously. Um, but sometimes when people go car shopping, they hear these stories. Um, uh, one of my coworkers was car shopping years ago, and she wanted to have a remote car starter installed in her car, and it was a new car she was buying. And the dealer said to her, uh, it was going to be eight or nine hundred dollars. And I kind of looked at her and said, that's too expensive. And she said, no, no, I'll have somebody local do it. And the dealer salesperson said, well, if you do that, it's going to void the warranty. I said, no, it won't. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was at an auto stereo store and I was telling the person at the auto stereo store the story about how the dealer said it would void the warranty. And he asked me who the dealer was. And I told him and he said, well, that's kind of funny because that same dealer is one of my customers and I install their car starters for them. So they said, oh, if you go someplace else, you'll avoid the warranty. But in fact, they would send their cars to this person to get the remote car starters put in. So it's a whole bunch of nonsense. As long as it's put in professionally and correctly, it won't void the warranty. And that goes the same for stereos and, and car alarms and all that sort of stuff. So it won't void the warranty. Um, does my car have a timing belt or a timing chain? And what's the difference? Well, years and years ago, all cars had timing chains and a timing chain connected the crankshaft of the engine to the camshaft of the engine. And when one part turned, the other part turned, pistons would go up and down and valves would open and close and the engine was happy. Um, that was all controlled with the timing chain. Over the years, timing chains were replaced with rubber timing belts. And the picture on the left, uh, the far left is a timing belt, the rubber timing belt. The kind of middle picture is a timing chain. They both do the same thing. Timing chains last almost forever. Timing belts wear out just like fan belts do on cars. Typically, the life of a timing belt is somewhere between 50 and 120,000 miles. Um, and the picture on the far right shows a lot of little cracking on the belt. Well, that's a belt that's getting ready to fail. And uh, if it does fail, it can, when it breaks, it can cause a lot of catastrophic damage to the engine. Um, are there things you can do yourself? Absolutely. As simple as checking the engine oil in your car. So many engines get ruined because they run out of oil. And even if your car burns oil or leaks oil, as long as you keep it full, the engine will last a really long time. So checking your car's oil is easy. Open the hood, warm up the engine a little bit, not red hot, but warm up the engine, shut it off, let it sit for a few minutes, find the engine oil dipstick, pull the dipstick out, wipe it off on a clean cloth, reinsert it back into the engine, take it back out, and read the oil level. Uh, the dipstick in that picture has four little marks on it. Uh, the one at the top is full. The one at the bottom is needs oil. It's down about a quart. And in the middle is considered a safe zone because you don't want to overfill engine oil. Checking engine coolant, almost as easy. That picture in the middle is actually my former car. And um, there's a mark that says minimum maximum. So check the engine coolant. Uh, if it's below that low mark, add a little coolant. If you see it go low again, suspect there's some kind of a leak and that you should go in and have it checked. Engine coolant is, you check it because it can, a little bit can be used over the, over a seasonal um, oil change, for instance, where they do check it. And they should be checking all of these things like engine coolant, brake fluid, transmission fluid, when you go in for an oil change service. Uh, brake fluid, again, pretty easy. Um, it's, uh, that picture is a kind of translucent reservoir. There's a low and a high place 
um, keep the fluid in the middle somewhere. If the fluid starts to go low, there could be a brake fluid um, leak of some sort. Also, as the brakes start to wear, the brake fluid will start to go down. It's normal. So if you haven't touched your brake fluid in a really long time and you decided to get under the hood and check it and you saw it was down to the minimum line, well, that could also mean your brakes are almost worn out. They're still going to stop fine, but they're almost worn out because as the brake pads wear, that the wear is made up with brake fluid. So the fluid will go down. Um, if you decide you want to add brake fluid to your car, only add it from a sealed container, um, not one that's been sitting around open because brake fluid attracts moisture. Uh, and moisture is, uh, moisture is a, a bad thing for, uh, for, for engines. Uh, check the tire pressure in your car, check the tire tread. And um, I want to stop sharing for just a minute. Um, when it comes down to checking tire pressure, there is no better way to do that than with a simple tire pressure gauge. This is a simple pencil style gauge. You push it on the end of the tire, thing pops out, tells you how much air is in. Well, there's all different kinds. This is a little dial gauge, uh, same idea, a little easy to read. Um, these used to be really, really expensive. This was a giveaway with a motorcycle uh, uh, school. You can get really fancy. You can get digital gauges like this that actually have, uh, this one's kind of fancy because it measures not just tire pressure, but it also can measure tread depth. We'll get into that in a minute. And it also records it so you can read all four tires have it stuck in memory so you know which tires need which air. Um, this is a more professional tire gauge. This is for almost like race car kind of things where tire pressure is very critical or people that race bicycles. This gauge actually has, a, has fluid in it that keeps the needle from bouncing around. Just another way to do it. At the end of the day, cheap pencil gauge, they're like $5. They're accurate, they work good. Um, I keep one in all of our cars, makes it nice and easy. Um, checking tire tread, uh, and I'll put the picture back up in a minute. Um, we always used to say, and we still do say, tires are completely worn out when they reach 230 seconds of tread. And 230 seconds of tread is the distance between the edge of a penny and Lincoln's head. But we prefer that you would keep your tires at 430 seconds of tread, which is the difference between the edge of a quarter and George Washington's head. And you can go out and buy a tire tread depth gauge thing that looks like this, and it has readings on it. You can actually read your tire tread depth, or you can get the, um, the fancy tire pressure gauge that has the, has the, um, measuring tool built right in and if you i don't know if you can see the thing but it actually says you know from zero tread up to so many 30 seconds fancy but you can do it all with a quarter and it makes it nice it makes it nice and easy to do it with a quarter so um so if you did it with a quarter and like the middle picture stuck the quarter in the tread if the tread came up at least to the top of washington's head the tread's still in pretty good shape. So that's going to be really all you, you need to do. If, it, if it's a penny, it's not enough tread. Um, in just about every state except Hawaii and someplace else, um, tires are considered unsafe and, and illegal, basically, when they're down to 230 seconds of tread. Um, when they're 430 seconds, they just work better. Uh, checking and changing your car's engine air filter or cabin air filter. A lot of cars today have two different filters, one for the engine and one for the cabin to keep pollen and dust out of the inside of the car. Um, one of my coworkers, she uh, was at the car, she was at her local Firestone store and they told her she needed a new cabin air filter and a new engine air filter. 
And she called me about a week and a half ago and she pulled out her cabin engineer filter from her car and she said, is this dirty and does it need to be replaced? And it was a little bit dirty. And she said, can I just go to the parts store and get one? I said, yeah. I said, what about the cabin filter? And they said, oh, I need one of those too. And I said, why don't you get one of those at the same time? They're not that hard to put in. So she's pretty resourceful. Um, she watched a YouTube video on how to replace her cabin air filter. And she came back and she called me up and said, I replaced the engine air filter. I replaced the cabin air filter. The parts cost me $40 and the local Firestone store wanted 150. So with your encouragement and YouTube's help, I saved 110 bucks, not bad. So you can do it yourself. It's not that hard. So um, talking about tires before, um, this picture sort of demonstrates what happens with tires. If you're driving in the rain and your tires are down to 230 seconds, so down to the distance between the edge of a penny and Lincoln's head, it's going to take you about 250 feet to stop um, from 60 miles an hour. A tire with 430 seconds of tread is going to take about 205 feet to stop. And a brand new tire is going to take about 160 feet to stop. My point is that if you have a kind of half worn tire, you know, when we say replace them at 430 seconds, but if you have one that's five or 630 seconds, the stopping distance could change by 50 or 60 feet. Well, 50 or 60 feet is the length of a tractor trailer truck. And that's the difference between a crash and one that didn't happen. So if you're driving down the freeway doing 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden you had a jam on the brakes and your tires were only two or three 30 seconds, it's going to take you 250 feet to stop. If your tires are in pretty good shape, it's going to take you 195 or 200 feet to stop. And again, that's the difference between a crash and one that didn't happen. So it's really important to make sure you have good tires on your car. Uh, the major reasons we go out to rescue people in the wind in year round with AAA is flat tires and dead batteries. And, you know, if you can kind of take care of that stuff on your own, you're less likely to call us. We want you to call us, but if you, if you don't have to, that's okay too. Um, washing and waxing your car, is it worth it? Absolutely. Um, there's nothing like hand washing a car because you can, you get to pay a little bit more attention to how the car is doing. You find those little scratches and dents. Maybe you can touch up those scratches. Um, I like to, I like to hand wash, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't really like to wash my car or wax it, but it's something that needs to be done. Um, but hand washing is best because you're using fresh water, lots of sponges, um, fresh soap. Um, you can try waterless car wash, which I've used before in the past. You just spray it on it kind of, the, the car's really dirty. It's not so great. If it's a little dusty and dirty. You spray it on, it emulsifies the dirt on there, and you wipe it all down with uh, microfiber cloths. You'll need a lot of microfiber cloths or an automatic car wash, which is my last thing I want to do, but sometimes you just do it because maybe it's wintertime. You want to wash the salt off the car, or you can't get to a hose, or you're going out somewhere and you want your car to look good, so you run it through the car wash. The only problem with the car wash is sometimes it sprays water where it was never designed. And sometimes the water is not always clean because they recycle all the water in their, in a car wash, which is good. But if the recycling system isn't working right, sometimes you're washing your car with dirty water. And in some cases, some car washes actually do that on purpose because they use the dirty water as a little bit of an abrasive um, to get the dirt off the car. So not my favorite. Um, waxing a car, money well spent uh, and time well spent. There's all kinds of wax, simple spray on wax to uh, hard carnauba wax, which is kind of a pain to put on and a pain to get off, but it's, the work is sometimes worth it. Um, I had a coworker who had a car, this was 10 years ago, and they went to go trade it in and the car looked terrible. It was all dull and dirty looking and didn't look like he cleaned the inside of it for a year. He went to trade it in. I think they offered him 
$3,500 for it. And I, and he came back kind of disappointed. Hey, they didn't want to give me anything for it. And I'm like, look at your car. It's a mess. Why don't we spend the afternoon and clean your car? So we clean the interior, shampooed the interior, um, nothing fancy. We just mixed up some uh, dish detergent and water, warm water, and just basically used the foam from the dish detergent and clean the interior, wiped the interior all down, got all the dirt off of it as much as we could, um, and then vacuumed it so it was really clean, sprayed a little bit of spray inside of it so it smelled nice inside, and then went to work on the outside of the car. Um, really waxing and buffing the car to get the paint to look good again. He went back to the same car dealership a week to 10 days later. And they offered him a thousand dollars more for the car. So an afternoon worth of work, a little bit of wax, made himself a thousand dollars more on a trade-in. So money well spent. The other part of it is if you get out there on a you know, nice day and wash and wax your car, you burn about 1200 calories. So you know, your car benefits and you do too. Uh, so will road salt really ruin my car? Absolutely. So it is important in winter weather. If you look at your car and it's all got white gooey sticky stuff all over it in the winter time, that's salt or um, magnesium chloride, which is worse than salt or um, calcium chloride, which is a little worse than salt. But all of those chemicals, including sodium chloride, which is salt, uh, will definitely eat your car away. So it is important to try to wash that junk off in the winter time uh, so it doesn't eat up your car. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is, can I upgrade the headlights in my car? I think I answered this question um, three times last week from uh, Newsday readers. And my headlights aren't that good. I want to put new headlights in. Can I put LED headlights in where I had regular headlight bulbs? And this picture shows a Jeep with a conventional headlight on the left and a LED headlight on the right, it looks much better, much whiter, much brighter. They're illegal. You can't really put them in. You can buy them, but technically you're not supposed to put them in because although they're brighter and they may be too bright, one thing, but they, but, but they don't get aimed correctly because the reflector that reflects the light inside the headlight bulb is designed for a certain length bulb. And when you put an LED bulb in, it's bigger and it reflects differently. So even though it looks brighter and whiter, it might blind oncoming traffic. So um, can I upgrade my headlights? Kind of. You can put brighter bulbs in that are legal, but be careful of the ones that are LED. Um, they may even say Department of Transportation approved, but you need to read the small print where it says not for on-road use or for novelty purposes. I've seen purple headlights and pink headlights and green headlights and halo lights that are a different color. So maybe it's a green car with green uh, circular lights around the headlights. They look kind of interesting, but they're not legal. Uh, you can buy them, but they're not legal. Uh, so the best place for car advice, where do you get it? From me? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, the knowledgeable person in the neighborhood or your Uncle Frank or somebody that knows everything or the car's owner's manual. The car's owner's manual is absolutely the best place to get advice about your car. And that's what I go to most times when I want to find out more information about a particular car. So if somebody says to me, oh, my, you know, my mechanic said I need to do this, or what do you think about this? I'll always, I use a lot of databases to look up information, but I will always go to the vehicle owner's manual um, as one of my first places to look to see what they recommend because they're the people that made the car. Um, again, if you want to get a hold of me, my email is jpaul at aaanortheast.com. Uh, easy way to get a hold of me is aaa.com slash car doctor. It says ask a question or something like that. I forget. And um, or ask the expert. And you put in put in a question. I will, I generally try to get back to everybody the same day. Um, somebody sent me an email yesterday and they put urgent next to it because they had a question that was regarding getting their car, their, their car was being towed to a car dealership and they wanted to get an answer before they got to the dealership. I was able to get them an answer right away, 
can't always guarantee that's going to happen, but I always try my best to get answers for people. So that's sort of my presentation. Um, let's see, shameless plug for the library. We have Chilton's library and auto repair source available free at the library. That's really helpful. Um, I use something called a, um, I use something called all data and Mitchell on demand for different resources. Um, they both, they both are good. Chilton's is another one. Um, one of the things that always comes up is years ago, I used to like literally keep a toolbox full of tools in my car. Today, I don't really do that. And like I said, in a lot of cases, um, when we have to go out and rescue people, one of the reasons we go to rescue them is because they have a flat tire or a dead battery. In technically three of our family cars, I keep a little air compressor in each one. So it plugs into the cigarette lighter or hooks up to the battery. And you know, if you come out of somewhere and you have a tire that's, you know, almost flat, you know, rather than having to change it plug in the little air compressor, hook up the little hose, pump it up. And, you know, don't forget about it because it's going to go flat again, but that's much easier than changing a flat tire. The other thing is sometimes you may, you know, when was the last time you looked at your spare tire? A lot of times people forget all about them, especially if it's, if you drive an SUV or a minivan or something like that, the spare tire is underneath the car. Well, there's hardly any real reason to go look at it. So it's important to, you know, you might take it out and it's flat. Well, if you have a little air compressor like this, you can easily pump it up and be ready to go. Um, batteries, we will, um, AAA, if you're a AAA member, will come out and test your battery. And, um, but I have something like this or this in my car. This is, and this isn't a endorsement of this particular product. Um, this is a, made by a company called Works, and they make things like leaf blowers and all kinds of goofy stuff. But this is kind of interesting because it's a it's a, a flashlight. It's a red flashlight. It's a blinking light. It's a it's a that kind of flashlight, and it's that which, if you're a Scout, I guess you would know that was Morse code. I didn't know that until one day I showed somebody this and they said, is that Morse code? Is that like SOS? And I went, I don't know, I guess, and it is. So, But what's nice about this is it's also a little set of jumper cable. So it's a self-contained little battery pack that you can jumpstart your car with. And I got looking at this today and it just plugs in to the side of it. And... I have either something that looks almost identical to this or um, a little box that has little jumper cables on it that I keep in our family cars. And the idea is I'll never ever use it, but you do have to check them periodically and make sure it's, it's properly charged. Um, this one's pretty nice because it actually has a little battery level meter on it. And this one's fully charged. Um, I just took one out of my, this is the annoying part. You have to go through all the light cycles to shut it back off. Um, but um, I just checked one in an older car we have, and it was completely dead. So if I had a dead battery, it wouldn't do me any good. So it was a good excuse when I looked at this one to go check the other ones. So now around my house, there's lithium ion batteries being charged up all over the place. So, um, But just to make sure they're fully charged, because most people think batteries fail in the wintertime, and they do. But all the damage to a battery happens in the summertime. Summer heat actually kills batteries. So in the wintertime, you may get out there, go to turn the key, and you hear it kind of rrr, rrr, cranking over slow, and it might crank over and start. In the summertime, the heat from the, from the summer heat affects the chemicals in the battery, and it will fail uh, really, really quickly. So you'll get out, you start your car in the morning, don't think anything of it, drive it to the grocery store or something, shut it off. You come back out, turn the key. You think somebody stole your battery because it's um, it's completely dead. Well, something like one of those little jumpstart packs can do a pretty good job of 
jump starting the car, getting it going. And, you know, sure, you can call AAA, but on the other hand, if you can do it yourself, um, you know, always nice to be able to do too. So um, there was a question, how often do you change your cabin air filter? Um, when it gets dirty, uh, bad answer, but, um, but kind of. Um, my wife's car is a Volkswagen. And the owner's manual says, change the cabin air filter every 30,000 miles. When it went in for its first oil change, they said, oh, do you want to change the cabin air filter? And she said, no. When it went in for a second oil change at 20,000 miles, she said, they said, oh, you know, you really should change the cabin air filter. And she said, no. And then I got curious when she came home and we were having the dealer change the oil because it had like three or four free oil changes or something. And um, we... Uh, I took the cabin air filter out and it looked fine. It wasn't even dirty. So it didn't need it. Finally, I think just last year I replaced it and it still wasn't that dirty, but it was time. It, I felt it was okay to do it. So um, not, um, and depending on the car, not that hard to do. Um, one Volkswagen we have pretty easy to do. Not too, too bad. We have a Hyundai uh, Santa Fe Sport, super easy to do. It's right behind the glove compartment. Um, you just open the glove compartment, let it kind of go open more than you would think it should. There's a little door back there, pull it out, put a new one in nice and easy. The third car we have is an old, older Volkswagen. You have to take half the car apart to get to it. Um, I did one day and I found out when I took it apart that it uh, apparently that model never had a cabinet filter. So it took me an hour to figure out it didn't have it, um, even though it said it could. Uh, another question was, is it true once you use synthetic oil, you always have to use synthetic oil? No, you, that is not true. Um, that is what people sometimes say, but synthetic oil is just oil. Um, it can be made from chemicals. The oil I just put in my car was Penn's oil. It's actually, their oil is actually made from natural gas. Never used it before. I was intrigued by it. That's what I used. It's synthetic oil. Uh, some synthetic oil is all chemical based. Most synthetic oil starts off as real oil, but it gets refined in such a way that all the molecules, the size of the molecules all match each other. So that's why it, it works better. So can you go from, you know, if you spent the money for synthetic oil and you said, well, oh, you know, I didn't see the real benefit. I'm gonna stick with the, you know, 29.95 oil chain, switch back, nothing bad will happen. Some other people will say, if you put synthetic oil in an older car, it will cause an oil leak. That is not true either. What it can do though, is because synthetic oil is, is good oil, it tends to wash away any dirt and sludge. And if the only thing holding your engine from leaking oil is dirt and sludge, it may find some oil leaks, but it won't cause oil leaks. So um, again, synthetic oil is oil. Um, I know somebody has an older Acura, they put synthetic oil in, it seeps a little bit. They don't put synthetic oil and it stops. They would like to, they use synthetic oil. They, they even have an antique car. They have a 1958 Pontiac and they use synthetic oil in that. But for some reason in the Acura, it seeps a little bit of oil with synthetic oil. Um, somebody, somebody emailed me the other day and they said, I don't have a car question. I have a lawnmower question. Can I use synthetic oil in my lawnmower? Sure, go ahead. Um, you know, as long as it meets the grade of whatever you're supposed to use. So uh, not at all. So it's easy, easy enough to do. So, um, so again, and I don't really carry, you know, I carry one of those like multi-tool things in my car, the pliers, knife, screwdriver, kind of Swiss army thing. Um, I don't carry any tools with me anymore because realistically there's not a lot you can do if your car breaks down. But if you get a flat tire or a dead battery, having a few things and I have them all in a, little zipper bag that um that i have um you know some paper towels and some window cleaner and some spray wax and i don't know um reusable shopping bags to go to the grocery i have store. one question yeah so i know you said read your manual to know how often you get your oil change and mm -hmm. i do that however with my car i have a, an updated um reading on my dash to tell me what percentage like right now right. i'm at 50 percent, but i haven't been driving so and it's been a while 
since I had my oil change. So do you trust that 50% marker or you, should I? Do you have a Honda? I do have a Honda. Yeah. Um, their systems are pretty accurate, but I would never go more than a year. Okay. Still, so even though it says 50% and it, and it could have been, you know, you could have had your oil change last February and now it's a year later and it still says 50%, I would still want to get it changed. Okay. So even though, um, and Hondas are pretty good because they have all these little clues that cues that come up that say do this and do that. Um, when you, there's a, one of the companies actually breaks down their uh, recommended maintenance into sort of miles and months. And still once a year is money well spent, especially if you haven't driven that much, but you've driven shorter distances, the oil can get a little bit contaminated. So um, changing, changing oil once a year, you won't go wrong doing it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Wow, that was easy. Well, if there's no other questions from anyone, Remember, you can find me at AAA.com slash car doctor. And I will, and like I said, I will answer. Um, I usually take Sundays off. So if you email me on Sunday, you might not get an answer on Sunday. But generally, most any other day of the week, I'll try to, I'll try to always answer people's questions for them. And if it has to do with maybe you're thinking about buying a new car, maybe you're thinking about selling your car, maybe it's a used car you think about buying. I have, I road test about, 50 different cars over the course of a year. And I've been doing that for a really long time. Um, some cars are pretty plain. Some cars are pretty fancy. Some cars are ridiculously expensive. Some cars are, you know, uh, uh, Mitsubishi Mirage, it's $13,999. Um, I, don't, I don't road test exotic cars very often, but every once in a while, one makes my way. So if you want to, if you want to buy a McLaren or an Acura, um, I, can, I can give you my opinion on those two. And just to give you an idea, spending a lot of money on a car doesn't really guarantee you're going to get the best car. Um, I drive a Hyundai Santa Fe Sport. It's a couple of years old now. It's a 2018. It was the old model. You know, it wasn't an expensive car. It's been pretty reliable. Hyundai's had some engine problems in the past. Mine seems to have skated around that. Uh, but even if it did, it's warranted for 100,000 miles. So you get it fixed. Um, but uh, I, and this is very, very unusual. It's only happened three times in 30 years. About two months ago, I drove a Rolls Royce Ghost. So it's a $450,000 car. So literally I parked it in my driveway and doubled the price of my house. And my house is worth nowhere near $450,000 um, living south of Boston, but I parked it in my driveway is worth more than my house was. Um, the left front brake rotor, left front brake caliper, the part that actually squeezes the brakes together and causes the car to stop was sticking. So every time I pulled up to a light, it was like eek, squeaky sound in a $450,000 car. You wouldn't expect that would happen in a car that's handmade, but it does happen. So, um, so uh, you know, price doesn't always mean you're gonna get super ridiculous quality. Um, it does mean you're gonna spend a lot of money and just like everything else, you know, I guess you can buy, you know, you can buy a Timex watch or a Rolex watch and they both tell time. So, uh, but there are better cars than others and some cars last longer than others, some cars, you know, Toyotas typically have a lot lower maintenance than some other cars do. Toyota and Honda, probably some of the best. Although recently, Consumer Reports just rated Mazda as one of their top picks for the first time ever because the cars have been so dependable in the last couple of years. So, and I agree, Mazda, Mazda has, the reason behind Mazda has gotten so dependable is they haven't really made a lot of changes. So they've kind of refined what they've been doing over and over again. And because of that, they've gotten very dependable. So anyway, if you need to get a hold of me, uh, jpaul at aaanortheast.com, aaa.com slash car doctor. Um, when I end my little radio show and yeah, a plug for me, I guess. If you're bored on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, go to North Shore 1049 
and I talk about cars for an hour um, and car stuff. Um, but I end my radio show this way. Uh, make sure you wear your seatbelt, drive safely, be good to your car, and wash your hands and wear a mask. <laughs> Thank you so much. I okay. hope everybody enjoyed. This presentation will be on YouTube in the next couple of days. So if you want to go back and review any of the slides and like what an amazing resource that we can email John with our car questions. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming and have a great night. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.